Thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to the Nick's Booth Podcast. I'm Shiler Mao. I'm joined here today by George Armstead. Uh, George, y- you work for USM, which stands for? United Shoe Machine. And you're really the last shoe distributor, shoe machine distributor in North America. Is that is that correct? No, I thought you were going to go towards you're the last standing, you know, dinosaur, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> no, there's, um, there's a couple of us still okay. trying, trying to sell product in this okay. country. No one manufactures anything in this country anymore as far as machinery. There's some rebuilt, but most of it's imported. Okay. Um, where do you get most of your machinery? The majority of our equipment comes out of Italy. Okay. But we also use Brazil and Taiwan. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Do you find that there's one country that's maybe better than others or just at least known for, for higher quality, obviously with a, with a higher cost? Yeah, the Italians have been doing it a lot longer than any of the Asian countries and, and even probably the Brazilians. So they've always made the high-end shoes. So they've always had high-end, you know, very, very good equipment. Some of it's, let's just say, overboard for what we do in this country. Okay. Um, because of the make Ferragamo and sure. all these high end sure. brand names that you know demand really precision stuff that we don't we don't need in our our world here in the United States. Uh, what is our world here in the United States? I think that's an interesting question because you know we used to make a ton of shoes here. We did. We did. Um, a, I guess, uh, w- when did that kind of stop? Um, and and B, well, we'll start we'll start there. When when did that stop? That really fell apart in, I would say, when the uh, Berlin Wall came down. Oh, interesting. Um, When that part of Europe opened up, it just changed the world completely. And so in that mid-80s, early 90s time frame, the U.S. uh, manufacturers who were here, and there were quite a few. When I started with the company back in 1980, we probably had... 2,500 shoe factories in this wow. country. Wow. Some very big companies, the brown shoes of the world, the U.S. shoes that had 15 to 20 factories each making women's shoes. Those companies just, the, the <laughs> an opinion here is that the, legally they just found it was a lot less hassle to import than it is to try to manufacture and deal with environmental issues, healthcare issues, you know, workman's comp issues. It just became the the modus operandi and everybody started leaving. The only, you asked about what what's here and what's going on, what's left in this country are either privately owned companies um, or military, people making right. military because right. they have to make those shoes here by the Berry Amendment. Other than that, it's privately owned like yourselves, like New Balance, um, uh, Red Wing is privately owned, um, Weinbrenner is an employee owned company. They choose to be here because they want to be here. Yep. Um, and even even a lot of those companies still do offshore a, oh, a significant mo- portion of their, I, of their volume. It, yeah, except for people out here in the Pacific Northwest, every one of them brings in the majority of their production, except for the military yep. guys come in from overseas. So you and I went out to visit the great people at McRae, yep. which is in North Carolina. Yep. They were kind enough to to let us kind of let me check out their operation and that was that was pretty wild. I mean, um, I imagine those have got to be by volume the largest manufacturers still left here. No, um, by volume, probably the largest footwear manufacturer is New Balance. Oh, interesting. They're running okay four or five shoe factories up in New England still. Okay. Now some of it is one hundred percent made in USA. Some of it is uppers outsoles brought in from somewhere outside of the United States, and they put them together, um, and that becomes assembled in the USA. Um, but by volume, they're probably putting out more shoes. And uh, on the military side, I think Belleville uh, Shoe, based oh, in really? um, okay. Belleville, Illinois, okay. they've got two factories beyond Belleville that they produce in. So I think they're a little bit bigger than McRae. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that was a really incredible operation because everything has to be made there, right? I mean, yes. there's some stuff. Yeah. I, you know, they, they mentioned that like military boots don't have steel shanks anymore no, because no. they can't source steel shanks domestically. So right. I think they use like fiberglass or, or that sort of thing. Yep. Um, but it was crazy to me, like kind of, you're going through this, like, um, 
you know, the, the various floors of the operation and, um, like they've got vulcanization capabilities down mm. at the bottom, you yeah. know, in the basement, yeah. these massive, really sophisticated, uh, machines for, for cutting everything out. But, um, yeah, that, that was just a really interesting dynamic to me to see that they kind of had to source and make everything there. Yep. Whereas I think, you know, businesses with, without businesses without that requirement, maybe have a little more flexibility and do things a little differently. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, for the military and, you know, for companies like yourselves that you, you self-impose made in America as much as you can, which is great. You know, un- unfortunately, the American supply chain is not as good as it used no, to be. No, and you're not. always struggling trying to get product and, you know, maintain that, you know, credo that you have to keep making stuff in the United States. And, you know, you have to every now and then give in. Yeah. But. Yeah, no, we, you know, it's, um, I, I wouldn't say we've been forced to make sacrifices from a quality standpoint. We've been had to make sacrifices from a, from a margin or a cost standpoint mm-hmm. for sure. Um, but, but yeah. No, I um, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that product coming in out of overseas is poor quality by any means. Um, you know, there's some good product that comes from overseas because sure. a lot of it was pushed over there by American companies, you know, sure. and they just started making over there to be the supplier to the Asian groups. So they're making the same stuff. They just don't make it here anymore. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, why don't we talk about some of the centers of shoemaking in the U S I think the Northeast is always kind of regarded as maybe one of the, the main um, areas where that was happening at least historically. I don't know if that's true as much anymore. Um, but what's your, what's your feeling on that? Yeah. I mean, historically Boston okay. was, the state of Massachusetts was huge. You know, if you go back far enough, there was a shoe factory in every town because they didn't have the oh, structure to ship and move like we do today. So it was just one of those things. Every every town had a shoe factory. The town I grew up in had one. I, in New England, you probably had 2,000 shoe factories at one time all by itself. Wow. Because of that, that's where the development of the shoe machinery was. That's where our company started. It was a collaboration between the Goodyear company and a couple others that became United Shoe Machinery um, back in the late 1800s and grew into this monopoly um, of, of a machinery manufacturer. And other companies were there too, but USM was the largest and maintained its monopoly through some monopolistic practices. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, no, I think that's, that is uh, like, like the rapidity for us is always this like... Um the, the white whale of equipment, you know, who, who can you tell me a little bit about the Rapidy? No, I, I, I apologize. You don't know that much about them. You know, USM was making outsole stitchers too for years and years. I want to say the Rapidy started in the Midwest. Okay. Because that was another shoe area. The St. Louis area was huge. St. You know, Missouri, Arkansas, that was the home of Brown shoe and a few other big companies. Um, so there was manufacturing of machinery out there at one time. You're, now you're talking about early 1900s kind of thing. Okay. And, you know, you look at the Rapid E, it looks like an early 1900s kind of machine. But some of this stuff was developed because there were shoe companies that did not want to work with USM because of our monopoly. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. we, we raised our own competition because of, the, you know, the way we do, did things. You've told me, um, refresh my memory, You told, there's another soul stitcher out there that is no longer made, is that correct? There's um, the, US, the USM... The big sole stitcher that's used in the well factories today is the British High Speed, the that's BHSS. What I'm yep. um, we made that in Beverly, Mass. Hasn't been made in probably probably thirty five years. But it's, it's still pretty widely used today, right? It is widely used. It is the the workhorse for that mm-hmm. operation, as is the GIS, which is the inseamer for stitching the welt onto the upper. But again, the the problem is as as the business shifted, we couldn't support building those kind of equipment. And, you know, we, we did maintain parts business for a while and then that kind of slipped and other people started supplying parts. And and the big issue that I personally have is, you know, I sold a lot of this equipment out there because I'm old enough to have been around and, you know, I'm trying to convert people away from these older machines because there's not the technical support nor there is consistent form of parts support. And at some point, you know, it's going to hit the wall for a lot of these companies that have, oh yeah, you know, half a dozen of these things. And so you've been involved with us in the Fioretto line out of Italy, which yep. they're the only company I know making high-end welted equipment. And it's all, you know, CAD CAM design, CNC made, so parts will fit forever kind of thing. And we've been involved, just to clarify, for the sole stitching capability, yep. um, not, yep. not necessarily the Goodyear welting. Right, right. Yep. The sole stitching for, yep. Uh, yep, for the heavy boots. 
Um, so there, there is a, there is a path. There's a path to keep going and to keep doing this. But, you know, those larger companies out there, you know, they have trouble with five-year plans. You know, they have trouble with 12-month sure. plans and they don't think that far ahead. And, you know, they'll replace when they have no options, you know, but right now it's uh, rob carcasses and do whatever they can to keep going and not invest the money. And yeah, no, I've seen these bidding wars for these rapid ease out there. Oh, you yeah. Know, they're, um, we, we get involved in them too. You know, I think we have one coming in and it's going to take about five months, you know, I think for us to get it. They've got to refurbish it. They've got to rebuild it. They've got to put in longer cams to, to make it work. To make it, stuff yeah. we're doing. It's, it's, it's really a no-win situation. You yeah. know, you know that. I know you do. And, um, and it's interesting because the only people running rapid ease are the PNW makers of yeah. footwear. And it's so it's really been focused out here. So we really haven't paid much attention to it per se um, until uh, this year. We're you know we're spending more effort out here trying to get again machines that people can get parts for. You know if if I leave any legacy behind in my forty some odd years of working, it's it's that I can sleep easy ethically that I left people with something and not a pig and a poke. Yeah, I mean it's my estimate just kind of off the napkin math here i think the the pnw boot business has maybe come close to doubling in the past uh really? past yeah. two or three years or so um yeah. and that's not just us that's that's kind of all of our um all of our brethren here you know it's been great to see the, the whole industry succeed and um you know we definitely beseech you george to 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 help us find some solutions for some of these yeah long-term i mean, problems. I mean the, the nice part about having this this wonderful little niche of factories here is it it makes it easy to come out here you know, if, if you were the only one, it becomes, you know, it's an investment for me to come out in the company and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's nice having a hub of sure. shoe people. Sure. That makes sense. And you're all but looking we're your, for this. We're your favorite, obviously. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. We're all looking okay. for the same thing and we're all trying to get, make more shoes because like you said, your market is fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's, it's defied the economy, which is great. I really suspect it will continue to. Well, I appreciate um, it, that, and we certainly knock on some fake wood here. <laughs> tell me, you know, tell me about the um, the graveyard of shoemakers, um, or at least maybe a few. Um, are there any that you've been kind of sad to see go or go out of business or at least be diminished in capacity here in the United States over the last 40 or 50 years? Oh, it was, it, you know, I, um, I spent a lot of time um, in the 80s up in the state of Maine. I was a sales, I ran a sales office for USM up there for a while. And I had the Dexter Group, I had GH Bass, I had Sebago, I had, you know, a lot of these hand-sewn people. And that's where I cut my teeth. I mean, I met, had some wonderful people that, you know, would bring a, you know, a 21-year-old college kid in and have them hand-sewn shoes and show them the process. It was, it was a wonderful way to learn. And none of those exist anymore. Mm. You know, it's just... So sad. I mean, those that are left in Maine, um, we have um, New Balance. We have Globe that makes fireman boots up there. Rancourt. We have Mike Rancourt making yep. some quality stuff. But it's just not It's not the same. Yep. You know, it's it's just different. And um, I miss it. You know, and, and there's people, a lot of people that, you know, mentored me um, in the process. And, you know, who knew when I started back in 1980, you know, coming right out of school, that... I would stay here for 44 years, you know. It, it reminds me a little bit. My father-in-law um, worked for Hewlett Packard straight out of, of college. Yeah. Um, and he was an engineer and um, obviously a great time to be involved with Hewlett Packard oh, you know, in the 60s yeah. and 70s. Yeah. Um, they split into several different companies. But his main thing was supporting a machine that tested the ability of radios to function on cell phones. And so... <laughs> That's they pioneered that technology, and he literally he subsequently is retired. But for for years and years and years, he was one of like four or five people in the world that knew how to run these diagnostic um, things. Because obviously, who's going to come up with a new machine to test? That's right. The radio capability of a phone. Yeah, and there's no business in that. However, there's still you need. still need to to call somebody on your phone occasionally. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, it's it's. You know, it's it's we're obviously we're not the only industry that's gone through this, and others will too. You know, it's just, it's it is sad. There's basically two of us from the old USM, myself and Charlie Williams. You know, in between us, we have a hundred plus years, and when we're gone, there's no one left. Hmm. It, you know, it's kind of no, it's true. It is. It's true. You know, we have. Um 
Yeah, it is an interesting dynamic, you know, for, from our perspective as Nix. You know, we have some machines, whether they're splitters or whether they're um, soul stitchers, you know, they're, they're literally like less than five people in the whole country that know how to repair these right. things. And when things, right. when things hit the fan, you're paying a lot of money to get these guys out here. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, it's a good niche while you, while you, while you have it, you know. It, it is. And, you know, but again, like I said, ethically, I want to make sure I leave people with machines I know that will be supported long after I'm gone, whether through USM or through direct from the manufacturers. You know, because those we try to only rep those who we believe are going to be strong and around. And, you know, again, like Fioretto and some of the others, the Chen Fangs of the world, we know they're there for the long run. And, you know, regardless, they can be contacted. You know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, we'll get you the right names. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll end with this. Um, and, you know, I just kind of have the question like, I've always had this perception um, that uh, because of the offshoring that we've seen, and I've heard this from other people that um, shoes today, maybe, you know, the mass market shoes that we all wear are maybe even less automated than they were 50 or 60 years ago. Is there any truth to that, um, given kind of the lower labor costs that, that people experience right now? There there was a, a lot of truth to that, certainly 20 years ago. Okay. Um, when, like I said, when the wall came down and the, these foreign markets opened up, people were throwing shoes out there to get the low labor cost. And quite honestly, you know, we had been building machines in Beverly and on our facilities in Germany and Europe that were much higher tech. And we were caught flat footed because China didn't want high tech machines. They just wanted bodies and they did things by hand. They didn't have the capability handling machines. And so that's when our market really started to fall down is because all these wonderful machines with all the bells and whistles we keep developing every year to make them better, more efficient for a high labor cost country, just didn't need them in China. So that's changing now. Obviously, China and the rest of the world is trying to automate more. You know, the the types of shoes they're making in Asia, I mean, it, as everybody knows, it's 99% athletic type footwear. Um, athletic footwear is going from a, I'll call it a cut and sew product to like a sonic welded product. Okay. So you're not even seeing the stitching anymore. You're just putting pieces in a, in a platen and putting it in an and oven. And that still works with the same materials as before? Like, do you, can No, you still some use of those materials change, but that's, again, that's probably the biggest advance in technology is the materials that they're using. Okay. Um, you know, leather's expensive, uh, inconsistent, uh, as you know. Band-made materials are fantastic, and for throwaway shoes, that's all they need. Yep. And if you can get away from sewing and all the skiving and all these other operations, it gets less and less expensive and it doesn't change the price of the shoes. They still seem to be jumping up there at that $200 range now sure. for these athletic shoes. But I'm, sh I'm, you know, I, I know there's big marketing and there's costs in their outsole development. That's really where they're putting the money into is foams and EVAs and carbon fiber plates and things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's, there's some automation over there, but there are still a huge number of bodies. Yeah. And that's just how they do it. Now, obviously, uh, what did we see in the news the other day that China's population took a, took a drop? Yeah. And, you know, their population is trying to get to a middle class. That's going to change things. You know, the, the problem with the footwear industry is it's always chased low-cost labor. You know, if it, you know, first it was Japan um, back in the 80s. Um, that's where Phil Knight went. Sure. To get his, the tiger, his pro, tiger, 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 Asia, yep. Asics. Then it went to Thailand. Um, then it went to China. Um, now it's Vietnam. Um, you know, in that area of the world, Indonesia. You know, where's it go after that? You know, the the problem we're is running we're, out of places. We're running out of places that at least have an infrastructure. Yep. I mean, you could talk about the African continent and places like that that certainly have low cost labor, but they don't have an infrastructure to support you know any kind of manufacturing. So. You know, maybe it's going to come back around. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd like I'd like to see it, but I'm not sure I will in my lifetime. Well, I'd like to see it too, and uh, we're doing our best to to kind of add some automation to our operations here while still maintaining that uh, kind of heritage handmade uh, feel. George, I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And, um, you know, uh, look forward to seeing you again. Look forward to working with you. All right. Thank, thank you. you.